titled Fighting Diseases. Please help us to click like and share our Facebook page. If you have any questions, please post your comments on the Facebook and we'll read out your questions during the Q&A sessions later. Please do allow me to give a brief introduction about Dr. Puna Wong, our distinguished speaker for tonight. Dr. Wong Yin On graduated from the University of Malaya. He joined Monash University, Malaysia in 2007 as Associate Professor in Internal Medicine to form the pioneer faculty of the clinical school in Johor Bahru. Dr. Wong is based in Johor Bahru since 1990. He has been sharing the Dharma regularly in Malaysia, Singapore, Jakarta the past two decades and was an invited speaker at the 3rd, 7th and 8th Global Conferences on Buddhism. Dr. Wong authored his first Dharma book entitled Walking in the Buddha's Footprints, 100 Reflective Essays back in 2016. He had recently launched his second Dhamma book entitled Breaking Myths and is now sharing chapters from his book weekly on Friday nights. Without further delay, I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Punawong. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. All right. Good evening, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Today is the 25th of December, and I wish everyone a happy new year, happy holidays, but please be safe. Try your best to avoid crowds as our country is still in the midst of a raging pandemic. Tonight, we're going to share with regards to what we as Buddhists can do and should do with regards to illnesses, disease, old age and degeneration that would affect every one of us inevitably. So tonight we are going to discuss the Buddhist teaching with regards to this. Now these are my medical students. Some of them, they follow us, me and my wife and some Dhamma brothers and sisters when we go and do wholesome works, good works. All right. Just let me be sure. Yes, yes. All right, so these are my students, and this is what we do when we teach them besides medicine, teaching them how to put the Dhamma into practice. Now, the association between illnesses and the Buddha Dharma is actually very, very close. Medicine and illnesses are often analogous to the Four Noble Truths. For example, within the Four Noble Truths, we talk about in the first truth, knowing what is dukkha, knowing what is suffering. In the second Noble Truth, we identify the causes of our dukkha. In the third Noble Truth, we know that there is a end point whereby dukkha ends when we avoid or eradicate the causes of dukkha. And the fourth noble truth, the things that we must do in order to achieve this. In medicine, it is talking about first a correct diagnosis, knowing the illness, then abandon the cause of the illness 
aspiring the cure, and of course, relying on the medical treatment. So you can see that there is a very close relationship between what is the Buddha Dharma and what are our physical illnesses. Now, a doctor would tell us what is wrong with us. And let's say it's a pneumonia. And what's the cause of this pneumonia? It could be streptococcal, it could be so many of the bacteria that is common. Now, of course, we worry about COVID-19. And then there is treatment for it, there's a cure. And then what we must do to get well, if it's a bacteria, then you need to take antibiotics, if it's a virus, then antiviral agents, etc. Now the Buddha tells us in the first noble truth, the presence of dukkha. What is dukkha? How to identify dukkha? How to recognize dukkha? And the Buddha also teaches us what is the cause of this dukkha? And that if we can stop the cause, then we stop the end result of dukkha. And the way to stop this by following the Noble Eightfold Path. Now, very broadly speaking, we have three categories of dukkha. In the Dukkata Sutta, it talks about dukkha, dukkha, sankara dukkha, and Viparinama dukkha. Put into contemporary language, dukkha dukkha would be what you and I call the ordinary pains and suffering. For example, if we are not mindful when we walk and we stub our toe against the furniture, then there is intense pain. That's ordinary suffering. Or if you have a toothache, for example, that's ordinary suffering, dukkha dukkha. Sankara Dukkha is the Dukkha which results from the change that is inevitably associated with everything. So if you buy a nice computer and the nice computer is working beautifully in the first year, and then by the second year you notice it slows down, its operating system is probably corrupted, there are probably lots of adware, etc. And Sankara Dukkha is the suffering, the Dukkha which arises because things are unreliable, things are unstable, and because of that, it cannot be relied on to be something which gives us peace, happiness. And Viparinama Dukkha is the inherent condition of all conditioned things, for example. We all start off like Sister Eileen, beautiful, young, good health, good body. But one day, as it inevitably will, we grow progressively old, we lose our hair, our joints ache, we develop diabetes, every man will have prostate issues, etc. So very broadly, the Buddha classified it into three huge categories of dukkha, or dissatisfaction, or unsatisfactoriness. So Dukkha Dukkata, the ordinary pain and feeling. Sankara Dukkata, caused because of all the in nature of condition existence being impermanent and unreliable. And Viparinama Dukkha associated with changes, no matter how pleasant, how good, like a brand new computer, after a while it deteriorates and it starts to malfunction. Now, I think it is very important that all of us as students of the Buddha Dharma, that we must realize that this is part of life. It is normal to be sick. This may sound shocking to many people, but it is normal. That as long as you have this physical body which is conditioned by so many things, we will inevitably degenerate and fall sick. So in the first noble truth, for example, the Buddha classified into seven big groups. 
birth, aging, sickness, death, sorrow, lamentation, despair, not getting what you want and of course getting what you don't want. All these are states whereby we will have dissatisfaction, psychological pain, physical pain, suffering, dukkha. And this is what we will call the common denominators of life. And the Buddha summarized all of this by saying, pancha upadana kanda dukkha. That as long as you have this emotional clinging, you are going to create dukkha. But if you do not cling and you accept it as reality, then that dukkha becomes progressively less. It is inevitable that as long as we work, as long as Brother Whaley works, Sister Leeming works, you're going to come into contact with both things which are very pleasant and things which are very unpleasant. And our nature is we grasp onto what is pleasant. We don't want it to end. And we reject, we push away whatever that is unpleasant. And in the process, creating a lot of psychological stress for ourselves without realizing the reality that whether it is unpleasant or pleasant, it is going to be there. And the Buddha Dharma teaches us to first recognize this as the common denominators of life. And that we can actually lessen its dukkha by not clinging or attached to it. That's why in the second noble truth, it also talks of tanha, craving. And as I said, in the first noble truth, it summarizes this as pancha upadana kanda. That as long as you grasp and hold and reject old age, reject sickness, reject death, you're going to suffer. So the first thing within the first noble truth is to recognize that as long as we are alive in this samsara, in this conditioned existence, you are going to go through all these common denominators and it is normal to grow old, to degenerate and be sick and finally die. I learned this a long time ago and I read what Ajahn Sumedho wrote in one of his early books about how a young woman one day came to the monastery in England with her baby. And the baby was unwell, the baby was coughing terribly, and the mother was very depressed and miserable. And I asked the Venerable Sumedho, why does my baby have to suffer like that? He's never hurt anybody. He's never done anything wrong. Why? And that is something which all of us similarly ask, isn't it? A lot of people when told, I'm so sorry you have diabetes. Oh, why me? Why me? I'm so sorry you've got cancer. Oh, why me? Why me? The question is, why always me? And the answer is, why not you? As long as you are a human being in a conditioned state, you're going to have such inevitable things occurring. So the Venerable Ajahn Sumedho answered, he's suffering because he was born. If he hasn't been born, he wouldn't have to suffer. And when we are born, well, it is like that. Having a human body means that you are going to experience sickness, pain, old age, and death. So the point this is trying to teach us is, the first noble truth, be realistic. See it, recognize it, understand it. Remember the first noble truth and all the four noble truths have three aspects. The first one is just a statement of fact. The second one is Sister Eileen thinking about it, reflecting upon it, seeing its reality in her life and in the surroundings. And in the third aspect to actually have direct insight that yeah, this is true. So it is common for most people, if not all of us, to fight to resist all this. But the hallmark of the Buddha's teachings is actually the opposite. Instead of fighting, it is the practice of metta karuna, loving kindness and compassion. And we must never forget that loving kindness and compassion begins with ourselves. 
we are told to love everyone with metta unconditionally but please remember brothers and sisters in the dhamma everyone includes yourself you are also to love yourself unconditionally whether your knees are good whether your prostate is good whether you've got menstrual cramp whether you've got diabetes or no diabetes love yourself unconditionally now the buddha was a very pragmatic man who didn't just teach a philosophy he told all his disciples he who attends to the sick attends to me so if sister li ming wants to serve the buddha well attend to the people who are in need and you are serving the buddha and when the buddha himself saw an elderly monk sick lying in his salt and foul robes the buddha with the help of venerable ananda personally bathed the monk and dressed him with fresh robes and that was the opportunity when he actually told the sangha community he who attends to the sick attends to me this is recorded in the vinaya i have taught this repeatedly to my medical students i have said it i don't know how many thousand times in all the sharings the past two and a half decades metta is not a down metta is a verb when we do metta meditation when we do metta chanting what we are doing is training the mind to develop the qualities of unconditional love but that quality of unconditional love has to become a virtue and what is a virtue a virtue is when you act on it metta then becomes a verb here i want to share with you a story very important a lesson i learned profoundly this must be at least more than a decade ago there's a certain major monastery which does this one million om mani padme hum chant every year over three days so for three days the participants are locked inside a huge hall and they do this chanting 24 hours non-stop until a millionth time is reached it's like the 20 or 4 hour meta chanting that is going to start tonight so a participant went through this three days of one million om mani padme hum chant at the end was the question and answer time and the venerable leading this one million om mani padme hum chant was a very senior monk the teacher in fact of his holiness the dalai lama and so someone in the audience raised the hand and said venerable does avalokiteshvara or kuan shi yin pusa exist silence in the hall you can hear a pin drop no one would have ever dared to ask a question like that but he did ask and the venerable without even the blink of an eye replied of course he exists but only in your mind he said then the person to ask was very disappointed he said in that case why are we chanting one million times so many but me home in which case the venerable again without hesitation replied that is because we want all of us to develop the qualities of unconditional love and compassion metta karuna in which case then the questioner in great defiance now raised his hand and said well in that case we might as well chant coca cola and the venerable again without hesitation replied excellent idea excellent if chanting coca cola he said can make you develop the virtues of metta karuna then chanting coca cola is even better because everywhere you go you see the symbol of coca cola you will be reminded every time you see coca cola of loving kindness and compassion so i think it is very important for us to realize that deep within all these trainings 
is for us to develop within ourselves these qualities. And for all of us, I repeat, while we think of meta meditation, meta radiation as doing for someone beyond us, we must remember that we are taught to have unconditional love for all beings without exception. And that includes Sister Eileen, Brother Ling Huat, Sister Wei, Brother Wei Li, Brother Chu Boon, Brother Chuan Tek Boon. All of us, myself included. And I think that is something we must not forget. So healing the body is only one aspect. Do not hate that diabetes or the hypertension or the enlarged prostate, or even those of you who have cancer, do not hate it. The World Health Organization defined human health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Well, the WHO is about 2,000 years behind the Buddha because 2,600 years ago, the Buddha already told us this. The Buddha taught that while every one of us would inevitably be short by the arrow of sickness and degeneration, you need not be short with the second arrow, which makes you sick in the mind as well. The first arrow, that is the physical pain, is inevitable. But the second arrow, that is the mental distress, is optional. So sickness and death is unavoidable. Let's be very frank. That's the first noble truth. To experience this is the dukkha that all of us will have, the dukkha dukkha, okay? The sankara dukkha, the viparinama dukkha. This is inevitable. But to be mentally defeated is a great misfortune. And the Buddha taught in the Nakula Pita Sutta, when the body is sick, the mind need not be sick. We can still maintain psychological well-being despite physical illness. And even for the unenlightened, you can still train your mind. Your mind may not be perfect, but you can still train the mind. And in meditation, it is obvious for anyone who meditates that your thoughts, your emotions are not you. They arise because of causes and conditions. And we have a choice. We can choose one thought over another. We can even choose one emotion over another. And this picture here says it well. Say to your mind, get as much depressed as you want to. I'm going to observe you, but I'm not going to join you. And I think this is extremely important. Any one of us here who has training in meditation would understand very clearly what I'm saying here. And for those of you who do not, it's time to learn how to meditate. This is another extremely important lesson that I hope to share. Often when we are sick, often when we are unwell, our whole world is just our illness and our problem. We are doing this. This is our illness. And our whole world encompassed by this illness. We cannot see anything else. We do not see anything else. Now illness is terrible, but it is part of our life. If we can put this hand at the end of our hand, stretch it out, then you see a big picture of which this illness is part of the picture. So my problem, which now blinds you to everything else, becomes a problem among a whole wide spectrum. And I think this is a very important lesson for every one of us, even before we are sick, and for those of us who have illnesses, many people in this audience are senior citizens. Waga Amas. They allow you to take out your EPF at 55 because after 55, you will have all kinds of chronic illnesses. So 
if you are well trained in the Buddha Dharma, your illness becomes part of the problem, not the whole problem. So this picture here is very important. Now, even if you are obsessed by your illness and you say, ah, oh, Dr. Wong, Li Ming says, Dr. Wong, I can't. My whole world is just this problem. My whole world is just this terrible illness. Then at the very least, be like this very pretty girl who is the president of my Monash Clinical School Buddhist Society. Open it up and peep through. At least through this illness, you can see that there is a bigger world, a bigger world out there. There are more things besides this illness. See through it and see the bigger picture. So how do we react to hard times? Often when told of some not too pleasant disease, people, people become angry, anxious, depressed, sad, guilt, etc. And so they can either shut down emotionally, make themselves a rock and say, my world, my world, it has collapsed. Or they can be resilient, positive, learn, discover new aspects and still grow. So this is already 50 years old. Dr. Kuba Ross, 50 years ago, analyzed and gave us this very beautiful description that whenever anyone is told of some illness, injury, disease, whether curable, uncurable, terminal or not terminal, will go through five psychological phases of denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And as a doctor, I worked for more than 35 years in medicine. You will see this in all the patients. When told of an illness, for example, let's just take an example, cancer. The first thing people will say, deny, deny, deny. I want a second opinion, a third opinion. I want my biopsy repeated. I want my biopsy reassessed, etc. Denial, completely understandable. And after that, when the diagnosis on repeated examination is still the same, anger. Why me? Well, at that point in time, of course, I cannot say why not you, and I'll, do, I'll probably get bashed in the face. But the reality is, why not you? But that's how human beings behave. Why me? And then after that comes the phase of bargaining. Oh, maybe if I pray to this God, I will be cured. Maybe if I give 10% of my income to this one, I will be cured. Maybe if I eat this magic mushroom, I will be cured. Maybe if I see this wonderful sensei, I will be cured. Bargaining. Again, as a doctor, we understand. And finally, when all the money spent and wasted never worked, they go into depression. And finally, acceptance. Now the same is seen in people who have lost loved ones. That means the family members, the one who is left behind the widower or the widow similarly goes through these phases. Of course, there are some men who throw a party, but that's another story altogether. Sister Eileen, we're not gonna go into that. So what do we do as Buddhists? What did our training tell us? For one, see beyond this. Like my president, at the very least, open the finger and look beyond and see that's a bigger world. If possible, put it all the way out. That's even better. Love your sick body. Remember, the metta that the Buddha taught us is unconditional. Your body has served you well. Be grateful for all the years. Gratitude is something the Buddha taught us in the very first teaching after his enlightenment where he showed gratitude to the Bodhi tree. Have loving kindness, compassion. Now when you're in health, more so when you're in sickness. And as I say, we need to learn to choose one thought over another, one emotion over another. And I like this cartoon, give yourself a good hug. Wrap your arms around your shoulders and give yourself a big squeeze. Ah. For those people, family members whom I conduct funerals, for example, I give 
the next of kin a big squeeze. It helps a lot. So this is something important. So it's not it is necessary to not just treat with medicine or surgery, but to treat the pain in the mind. And we certainly don't want us to become angry at ourselves or angry at the whole world because that would only make it worse. So a well-trained student of the Dhamma will have the physical pain of the body, but not the mental pain of the mind. So the first is cured with medicines. The second is cured with Dhamma. So there are two aspects. Now, Susie, Kelvin and Hobbes, the girl next door is Susie. Kelvin, the naughty boy. Kelvin ultimately married Susie. But Susie is always the wise girl, the rational girl. Well, Kelvin is the emotional naughty boy. And Susie says, when life gives you lemon, have a lemonade. Fantastic attitude. Kelvin says, I say when life gives you a lemon, wing it right back and add some lemons of your own. We don't want this. We want this. Let us remain calm like Susie in the face of illness, mindful of all the good things present and good things left. Let illness be a part of the big picture, not the entire picture. And one of the trainings we have spoke about for the last two, three months is of, is of course mindfulness, be in the present. And another way we can calm ourselves down to focus on the present moment is to live in the present moment. And again, this is, of course, what is taught in meditation. I can feel the breeze on my face. I can hear the sound of my breathing. I can smell the dirt on the ground. I can feel the crunch of the leaves. Isn't this what we all do in meditation? What a great day. You are alive. Now, even the Buddha had physical illnesses as he grew old. The canon is has many records of the Buddha suffering from physical illness. All right? Now, the Buddha only had the physical suffering. He had back pain, he had headaches. I'm sure his knees hurt after all that walking, but his mind was freed from suffering. He had only the first arrow, which is inevitable. As long as you had a physical body, he didn't have the second arrow. Now in the suttas, there's one particular sutta called the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, the Gananikaya 16. And when you read it, you will see how the Buddha had physical pains, severe illnesses, and how his mind remained clear, comprehending, and unperturbed. This, of course, is the ideal. So our language betrays our attitude. We are told to fight the illness, don't surrender, beat it. If you look at the language, it's all a war. And then you become a victim of war. A raging patient caught in a civil war, me against a damn cancer. Love, compassion evaporates. Calmness, tranquility destroyed, and you get worse. Now, both the arrows are stuck and hurting badly. So, all illnesses are lessons. They are divine messengers on the realities of life. They ask you, look at the first noble truth. Can you not see the first noble truth? Okay, so illness and wellness are not dualities. Neither are they mutually exclusive. At any point in time, millions of cells are turning cancerous. They just do not go beyond that stage and get that destroyed. Now a person new to the Buddha Dharma might find the notion of being kind and loving to illness instead of fighting, killing, destroying it, strange and counterintuitive. But we need to learn how to be sick. And learning how to be sick is not passive or indifferent. It is accepting our sick bodies, taking care of it, and most importantly, not our, allowing our minds to be worse for it. So take all modern medicine, take whatever modern surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, antibiotics, antiviruses. But at every opportunity, calm yourself, still your mind, 
and radiate loving kindness to your body. It could be very simple. May my body and mind be at ease. May I be content and be at ease. May my cancerous prostate, painful joints be at ease. Thank you for serving me so long. May I be free from physical pain and mental suffering. Something I think every Buddhist is familiar with. Genuinely radiate love to the body. Not, not just words, but genuine feelings. I think this is another very important point. If you are just like a parrot, parroting words without feelings, I don't think it's going to do much good. You got to really generate feelings, wish the ill body with good thoughts and feelings, the painful back, the swollen legs, etc. Anger serves no purpose. Treat it with gentleness and love instead. Remember, words are very powerful. Don't speak negatively about yourself, even as a joke. Very often, I see patients who curse their knees and curse whichever part is hurting. Oh, this terrible leg is so horrible. And then they beat the leg, they bang the knee, etc. Your body doesn't know the difference. Words are energy. That's why we call it spelling. Change the way you speak to yourself, to your body, to your disease. Imagine if speaking to plants can make them grow. Imagine what speaking kindly to human beings can do. So when a loved one is sick or when we are sick, any metta will be very useful. Visiting a loved one, radiate metta, act with metta, demonstrate loving kindness, or if they understand, lovingly chant the metta sutta for them. This will be very powerful. But of course, they must understand what you are chanting. If not, it's just meaning, meaningless words. And hence, it is important for all of us as Buddhists to familiarize ourselves with at least a few chants, suttas, because we associate them with wholesomeness. We associate them with positivity. And whenever we hear them, whether we are fully conscious, semi-conscious, or even unconscious, that, that positivity creates good feelings, positive vibes. And something as simple as the Sumangala Gatta, which I'm sure many of us here are familiar with, every time we offer food, the venerables would end their blessing with this, but want to Sabamangala. So if you are familiar with this, then you have associated this with something wholesome. And that association helps us to remember that these are wholesome things. These are wholesome thoughts. These are very powerful, wholesome words. And our mind becomes positive. Whatever it is, do it on a regular basis. The Venerable Xuan Chang, for example, most of you would have heard about him. Many would have seen the stories. Some of you would have even gone onto his footsteps, how he traveled through huge swaths of desert, blizzards, high mountains in his quest to go to India to collect suttas. Now, before he left, he was taught the Heart Sutra. That became one of his favorite sutras. And he kept on chanting it. And every time he came with, across difficulties in his three-year journey, he chanted the Heart Sutta, which, you, as you know, has all the Dhamma encapsulated within it. So those words provided him lots of comfort, strength to carry on. And it is said that even on his deathbed when he was in his 60s, he was still chanting this sutta. So similarly for all of us, I think it is important that at the very least you be familiar with one or two such that it can give you strength. It can give you comfort at times when you need it, whatever that sutta may be. 
So positive, wholesome thoughts are extremely important when one is sick, whether the person is doing it for himself or we are doing it for that person. I am strong, I'm brave, I can get through this. These are very powerful words. Calmly repeat them as you breathe in and out. Calmly repeat, may I be well, may I be happy, may I be free from pain and suffering. Calmly recite the Bhavantu Sabamangalam. Calmly recite Metta Sutta. Or for those of you who are familiar with the Heart Sutta, calmly recite the Heart Sutra. It will give you lots of strength. Everything is temporary, thoughts, emotion, people, scenery. As long as you do not attach, you flow with it, your suffering lessens. So when we are sick, and of course many of us recover, pick that as a lesson. It teaches you the first noble truth. It teaches you to value your life. It teaches you now how to treat other people who are sick. Now, why are you sick? Why always me? Why me? It's very simple, Sister Eileen. It's very simple, Brother Weili. It's because you are anatta. You suffer because you are not in control of your lives. You think you are in control. But the Buddha's teachings of anatta clearly teaches us we are not in control. Our lives are subject to innumerable and immeasurable causes and conditions. And this can transform or even end our lives at any moment. A year ago, no one would have thought of COVID-19 hitting us so badly. A year ago, the world was a completely different world. A year ago, we were leading completely different lives. Now, if this lesson over the last one year had not taught us a Nietzsche, impermanence or unstable, dukkha, dissatisfaction, unreliability, anatta, not self, and then I don't know where you have been, where have you been hiding the last one year? This is the Dhamma staring right in our faces. So despite all this, we can still go on. In the Theragatha, this venerable said, I'm blind, my eyes are destroyed. He could have diabetes for all I know, diabetic retinopathy. I've stumbled on a wilderness track. But even if I must crawl, he said, I'll go on, but not with an evil companion. I will not compromise. So a venerable taught me a very valuable lesson. He said, as a monk, every day, you know, people come and ask for a blessing. Blessing, 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 blessing. Brother Chui Boon was talking earlier about blessing, blessing, blessing. Everybody, he says, come to me asking for my blessing. Before exam, blessing. Before travel, blessing. He said, of course, as a monk, I give them this blessing. But he said, I always tell them that the best person to give you the most powerful blessing is not me, the monk, but the one who loves you the most. Because that metta is the most powerful. And he said, go home. Ask your parents for their blessing. For no one loves you more than them. No one on earth will have more metta for you than them. Their blessing is the most powerful. How many of us here are aware of this? For any blessing to work, that monk must be very well developed in his metta in his wisdom, in his karuna. Your parents have more metta for you than anyone on this earth. So metta radiation must be done with genuine love or it's just words. Even animals can sense metta. So metta is not just simply reciting like a parrot. It must be used to develop our minds it must be used to transform our minds, as I gave the example earlier in a one million Mani Pani Hum chant. Metta must be made into a virtue, a verb. And the Buddha challenges to develop unconditional metta for all. And which example did the Buddha use? He gave the love of a mother for her only child. Now, 
Every one of you in this audience who are mothers will know. No mother will just keep on saying, I love you, I love you, I love you to her child. That's useless. But that love is expressed in every bit of action from dawn to dusk in making the best for the child, providing the best for the child, and even when the child is asleep. That, brothers and sisters, is matter. Even in the final moment of death, a well-trained person can remain calm and composed. Instead of pleading, fighting the inevitable and prodding the person, don't die, don't die, please don't die. As students of the Buddha Dharma, we calmly accept the impermanent and non-self nature of life and give permission for the dying person to depart, assuring him that all is well and that he or she can live in peace, calmness, and love. Now, many of you might ask me, is this possible? Is it doable? In my own personal experience, when my late father was dying, and it was obvious he was dying, even I found it difficult to verbalize this out. But my daughter, my first daughter, who rushed from her office, came into the room, saw the grandfather, and she actually verbalized what I just said to the grandfather and told Ye Ye, whatever that we discussed just now. And Ye Ye passed away peacefully after that. So we need Dharma, not drama. A lot of times it's a lot of drama and not Dhamma. Now there's something called a physician's wow based on the Buddhist teachings. And it's an ethical commitment for all Buddhist doctors. And I've shared this many a times with my medical students, with other universities as well. And it's the equivalent of the Hippocratic oath. This is the copy of the oath that hangs in my office in the university. And in the oath, it talks of the teachings of the Buddha with regards to the qualities of the caregiver. That the caregiver must have knowledge and competence in dispensing medicine. He must know what is agreeable and disagreeable and refrain from giving what is disagreeable. First, do no harm. He should be compassionate, kind, and very important, not be motivated by personal gain. He should not be repulsed by saliva, phlegm, urine, stools, sores. And very importantly, the Buddha said, the caregiver should be able to counsel the patient with mental and psychological support, the Dhamma, in appropriate times. This preceded the World Health Organization by 2,600 years. Now, when one is sick, of course, the kindness of the doctors, the nurses, the relatives, the caregiver is just as important as the medicine. This is metta and karuna in action. This is crucial. And you will notice that the Buddhist physician oath is completely secular. No talk of magic, prayer, forgiveness, no talk of sacrifices, no talk of offerings, none. It's completely secular. That's the Buddhist teachings. So the four Brahma Viharas of loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity is crucial for any healthcare professional. Compassion is understanding another person's suffering. Empathy is to be able to stand in the shoe of that person and to actually know how he would have felt. These two qualities are most important for all caregivers. So as you can see, the Buddhist teachings with regards to sickness, health, treatment, medicine, caregivers is rational and pragmatic. And I've always said this, a good person is not based on his religion, not based on what is written in his IC, not based on what is in his official documents. A good person is based on how he treats people, how he is. That's the important thing. It is karma. 
So doctors see harsh realities daily. Every day they see life and death. COVID-19 only makes it worse. Now the age of believing is over. We are now in the age of knowing. Just believing serves no purpose. Now it's an information age, the new industrial revolution. You can no longer tell people to believe. You must show people the realities. People always ask me, which is the best university? Which is the best exam? Which is the most difficult exam? And I always tell people as a medical educator, the most important exam for the future doctor is not the final exam, not the end of the year exam, no. The most important exam, if any, is the entrance exam. And that is because you are trying to sieve out people who have a love for humanity versus people who have no love for humanity and is only there because their mother wants them to do medicine or they want to make lots of money, both of which are going to be very disappointed. So metta means unconditional love, but it doesn't mean sister Eileen that you go around hugging everyone you meet on the street. I love you. I love you. I love you. A drug addict, an alcoholic, a pimp. And you say, I like them. I love them. That is silly. And why I always say that is because as doctors, we deal with drug addicts, we deal with prostitutes, we deal with pimps, we deal with prisoners, we deal with the best of humanity and the worst of humanity. And I teach my students, you must have meta. But meta doesn't mean you go around hugging them, telling them, I love you, I like you. That is being silly. Meta here would mean that you refrain from anger and vindictiveness, from any desire to hurt them you still would treat them like you treat your own brother. So even though you may not like what they do, they are miserable, wretched people, but you can still be kind, generous, and charitable towards them. This used to hang in my clinic before I retired from clinical practice. I try to inspire myself every day as I look at this. And when you visit a terminally ill patient, Often we are sad, but it's actually unwise to have such negative thoughts. Instead, share the Dhamma, genuinely radiate loving kindness, give blessings, help the person take refuge, let the person's mind be comforted, remind him of all the good things he has done in dana, in bhavana, in pilgrimage, because we want him to be happy and peaceful. And even for an unconscious person, hearing is one of the last senses to go. They can still sense the emotions and the thoughts of the people around them. So, you know, there's a humorous record in the Nikayas, and this is about a king who told his barber, if you see the first white hair on my head, remind me, the divine messengers have appeared, sire. Gray hairs are to be seen growing on your majesty's head. Here I take off my cap. Every time you see me, you see the divine messengers. Every time I look at myself in the mirror, I see the devas talking to me. There is no escape from these four mountains of birth, old age, sickness, and death. So let us do our best, accept it. The Buddha says there are three types of patients. Aha, how many of you know that the Buddha even talked about this? He said there are three types of patients. There are those who will not recover whatever you do. That is what we call palliative care. And there are those who will recover no matter what you do or don't do. Like when you have a common cold. So that's what we give symptomatic treatment. And of course, there are those who will only recover with suitable medical treatment. And that's when we give curative treatment. But all three must be treated. When Ajahn Brahm was last in Johor Bahru, of course, I rounded up all my medical students who are Buddhists to meet him. And he asked the students, what is the most important duty of a doctor? Of course, some students reply, oh, to diagnose, to this, to cure, to operate, blah, 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 blah. But Ajahn Brahm ultimately told them, the most important duty of a doctor is to care. 
C A R E. The rest will follow. So, so many gods, so many creeds, so many beliefs that whine and twist, while just the art of being kind, metta, loving kindness, which Tribune is going to take part tonight, which Brother Ling Huat is going to lead tonight. Metta, loving kindness. If you can develop your mind to have this and turn it into a verb, a virtue, this is basically what this sad world needs. My religion is very simple. It's simply kindness. Metta karuna as a virtue. So it is action. It is our karma, which is important. Not faith, not prayer, not anger. The Buddha even spoke about the duty of a patient. He said the patient must cooperate with the doctor and the nurse. He must only take and do only what is agreeable to him. So if you have illnesses related to your lungs, for heaven's sake, when we tell you to stop smoking, please stop smoking. Please stop drinking alcohol, etc. And even in taking agreeable food, he should know the proper quantity. So if you've got diabetes, when we tell you, please cut down on your carbohydrates, please do that. And you should take the prescribed medicine without fuss. Oh, this is a major thing. You want to save the poor fella, you prescribe him statins to lower his cholesterol. Then he got one Yima Kuche who tell him the statin will destroy his liver and then he stops taking it. Well, I've got nothing to say. I always tell people you have a right to commit suicide, but you have no right to commit murder. So if you refuse to take, that's fine. But please don't tell other people not to take. He should honestly disclose his ailments to his duty conscious nurse. So if you've been exposed to COVID-19, for heaven's sake, admit it. Don't hide that fact. And the Buddha even said you should patiently bear physical pain. Now here I come to the last part, the role of Kalyana meters. Now things will fall apart as it will inevitably fall apart because of the universal characteristic of a nature, impermanence. Every one of us will lose someone dear to us. Every one of us will fall sick with some illness. Every one of us will have great emotional stress. And this is the time when the warm support, tenderness, empathy, and kindness of Kayanamitas is crucial. Come out of the bubble. You're not alone. One. Two, as Kayanamitas, do everything you can to help. Support with all that is good and protect the person from all that harms. Kayanamitas, please be aware of these five stages of psychological roller coaster that I already shared earlier. And then you will know why your friend is behaving like that and we will know how to adapt. At the phase of anger, for example, sometimes all they need is someone to sit with them and to listen and to help them vent their anger, etc. Now at the most vulnerable time when we are psychologically most tired and desperate, vouchers come flying around. In Singapore, it is not allowed, as you can see, this big poster in SGH. In Malaysia, I still come across very sad incidences whereby some people at the very last minute had such psychological brainwashing and the whole family suffers. So this is very important. And this card is taken from Singapore. It asks the Buddhists to keep this card with them. And when someone approaches you in the hospital or in the dialysis center or in palliative care in the hospice, show this card. And Brother Tan Ling Huat is with us today. He's the ex-president. I plead with you, I plead with all the Buddhist societies that are associated with our sharing. Can we make a card like that? Can we laminate it and make sure that our senior citizens, etc., are holding a card like this? Because I've seen too many sad, painful incidences. So in Singapore, it is clear, but in Malaysia, we are still not well SOP on this. So I hope the Tarabara Buddhist Council of Malaysia can do something. 
if not the Buddhist societies. Ultimately, we will all have one common end, and that is death. No doctor can prevent that. But the Dhamma can help us face it. And the Buddha in the Itibutaka has been described as an unsurpassed doctor and surgeon, but not for the body, but for the mind. We are not heirs of material things, but we are heirs to the Dhamma. He is transiting. This is a beautiful word. When someone is dying and we say, oh dear brother so-and-so is dying, it sounds so horribly negative. I want us to replace it with a new term. He is transiting. Like a transit launch in an airport, brothers and sisters. He is transiting. Death can be beautiful if one has the capacity to accept it. If one can open the doors for death with a welcoming heart, a warm reception. Yeah, because I am born, I will die. Now that day is come, the circle is complete. I am ready to transit. And when one receives death as a guest, a welcome guest, the quality of the phenomena changes immediately. Suddenly now you are deathless. Kusen Umir. The idea is not to live forever, but to create something that will share the Dhamma. And the Johor Gladian's team is why not me? I want to end by showing you a video. I hope you will learn something from this video. Please pay attention. Illness, old age, part of our life, it comes. Now better to look at that part of our life. Sooner or later, it will come. Now important is while we are alive, our daily life should be meaningful. Meaningful means, if possible, help others. Uh, if not, at least reach and harming others. That's a meaningful life. Okay. And then at the end come, you will not have any regret. There's no video. I share my life honestly, truthfully, more compassionately, and I done something good for others. Then at the end of come, you feel happy. Then according to religious tradition, if there is God, uh, God will look after you. If no God, uh, See, we are self, huh? self, no video. self creation yeah. because of the self, self creation. So, you done it's, uh, it's meaningful just... life. So, that's guarantee your next life will be. Um, I'm just told that the video didn't come on. Let me try it again. Illness, openness, illness. Okay, I was told the video did not come on by my dear wife. Old age, part of our life, it come. Now better to look at that part of our life, sooner or later it will come. Now important is while we are alive, our daily life should be meaningful. Meaningful means, if possible, help others. Uh, if not, at least reach and harming other. That's a meaningful life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. and then at the end come, you will not have any regret. I carry my life honestly, truthfully, more compassionately, and I done something good for others. Then at the end of come, you feel happy. Then according to religious tradition, 
If there is God, uh, God will look after you. If no God, uh, see, we are self, self, self creation, yeah. because of the self, self creation. So you done meaningful life. So that's guarantee your next life will be happy, nice life. So that's a non-theistic religious tradition. There's no creator, but oneself as a creator. So goes one's own like the later part of our life much depend on early part of your life, study uh, and including sort of exercise. And then the result, uh, good result come later part of your life. Similarly, this life, we carry meaningful life, uh, helping other. This life we utilize for something good for other, more compassionate way. Then you see that's effect next life. So, so therefore, the death is something like change of clothes. <laughs> clothes become dirty mm. or old. Then time comes to change. Similarly, this body uh, becomes too old or too old. Then time comes to change. Okay. So, look that that way. Otherwise, you see, that is something mystery and dark. So you may get feeling of as well, too much anxiety, fear like that. But if you if you know about the death, and I think uh, either theistic religion believe God, or non theistic religion believe yourself, you can carry your life meaningful way. Then there's a guarantee. So at the end, no regret. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, brothers and sisters, I think that the, the Buddha Dharma has been very well taught by the Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And um, I think that I can't say anything more. His teaching there was actually very, very clear. And I hope that the sharing tonight has benefited all of us. As I said, all of us are getting old. I certainly do not deny that fact. And all of us will have illnesses, degenerative joints, chronic illnesses, diabetes, hypertension. Every man above 55 will have prostate issues. But the Buddha Dharma had actually taught us very, very well how to handle such issues and um, I hope that with this, we can end this year 2020 and Nick's sharing will be on the first. We're very lucky that we're sharing on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. So thank you so much. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Dr. Puna. Well said about this topic. Most often, we are too focused into fighting diseases that happen to our body physically. We must not forget to heal uh, mental pain as well, right? Through loving kindness and uh, compassion. So, metta meditation is a good start for this purpose. Uh, to all our online viewers, please continue to post your question on the Facebook comments. Um, at, at this uh, moment, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Puna uh, one, uh, a few questions here. Um, you mentioned that, you know, uh, chanting, uh, it is also could uh, help the, uh, the, the sick um, when times in need. Um, but then my question here would be, you know, is it okay for us not to do uh, chanting in Pali? Because um, in general, not many people of uh, uh, of us who are in this uh, Theravada uh, Buddhism will understand uh, the Pali language and uh, could not memorize the sutta as well in the chanting. Uh, is it okay for um, us to 
chant in English so that the person on the sick bed, right, could at least understand what we chant. Thank you, Sister Eileen. That's a wonderful question, very important. And I've answered that question many times and got myself kicked out of a few centers. So I nevertheless will tell you. Now, very, very often when someone is sick or dying and brothers and sisters go and visit, they will do chanting. And for the person who is sick, if that person, of course, is someone familiar with, at the very least, the basic chants like the Namotasa, the three refuges, the five precepts, then that's wonderful because help the person pay respect to the Buddha with the Namotasa, help the person take the three refuges together and help the person take the five precepts. That's wonderful. If you can do that, 99% of the job is done. Then the next step, do we chant any suttas? And every very often people will immediately raise up their hand and say, oh, we will chant the Bojanga Sutta. Why? Because in the canon, it is documented that the Bojanga Sutta was chanted and so and so got well. Here I must raise a few points. If you look at the Nikayas, there are many instances whereby either the Buddha or his dis disciples visited the sick. When the sick person that was being visited is an arahan or an awakened being, then they would chant the Bojanga Sutta. The Bojanga Sutta talks about the seven factors of awakening. That means to say that this arahan who is sick, he actually fully understands the seven factors of awakening. And chanting the seven factors of awakening reminds him of what he has done, what he has gone through, and gives him lots of joys and confidence. In our same Pali Canon, we have many instances whereby either the Buddha or the senior disciples visited people who were not arahants. Some are lay people. And what did the Buddha instruct in those circumstances? He did not tell them to chant the Bojanga Sutta. In these situations, what they did was go share the Dhamma. And they spoke to the sick person in a language that they understood. They actually shared the Dhamma with them. Now, we have to realize that our obsession with the Pali language must have its limitations. Many people do not understand Pali. And so if you go there and you start chanting in Pali, especially to relatives who are listening in, they're wondering what is this fellow doing, our magica or our bomoga or what. So we do not even want anything that might give a negative impression. And we don't have to be obsessed with Pali. Now, again, this will get me probably kicked out of a few more centers, but how many of you realize that the Buddha probably did not speak in Pali? Despite what our traditionalists insist on, actually modern scholarship shows that the Buddha probably did not speak in Pali. If anything, he very likely spoke in Magandhi, which is the dialect of North East India. Pali is a dialect that is actually slightly more West. And while Pali and Magandhi Pali and Sanskrit share many things in common like Bahasa Indonesia and Bahasa Malaysia, they're actually not the same. And Pali is a dialect which doesn't have any written script. That's why all our Pali texts are written in Roman uh, alphabets or in Burmese or, or, or Thai or uh, Sinhalese. All right, the Buddha himself probably spoke Magandhi, but they use the dialect of Pali just like Eileen from Klang might be speaking in Hokkien, but when Eileen meets me and she speaks to me in Hokkien, I understand only 5%. So we decided that we'll speak in Mandarin instead. And so it was made that Pali, Mandarin in this context would be the language in which we will have a common basis of comparison. So I do not personally feel there's this obsession that we must chant in Pali. In fact, if you visit Ajahn Brahm's monastery, you will see many of them chant in English. And I think that it is very important 
that the person to whom we are trying to share understands the message. If they understand the message, then that is wonderful because it is to give them confidence. It is to give them reassurance. It is to remind them of the Dhamma. But if Sister Eileen is the one who is sick and Sister Eileen remembers the Metta Sutta, she remembers the Sumangala Gata, fine. Then we will definitely chant the Metta Sutta and the Sumangala Gata because Eileen associates that with wholesomeness, with the Dhamma. Which is why I gave the example of Xuan Chang. When he walked up and down the deserts, when he climbed the blizzards, when he almost got killed, etc., etc., he repeatedly chanted the Heart Sutra. And I think it's not that there's anything magical in that, but that that is literally the jits of the Dharma. And the Dharma gave him strength. It's the same thing today. You can chant anything. As long as that is associated with wholesome qualities in your mind, even Coca-Cola would work. And I remember one sister wrote to me that Ajahn Brahm said, if Coca-Cola can help you steal the mind, then chant instead of Budo Budo, chant Coca-Cola, if that helps you steal the mind. Because we must remember all these are fingers pointing at the moon. It is the direction to which it is pointing to, which is important. But sometimes we get so obsessed, we argue, we debate, we fight over the finger, not realizing that that is not what is important. So Sister Eileen, you have asked a very important question and I'll summarize it. The important thing is to show Metta Karuna and that you can show genuinely, people can feel. Second, the important thing is to help that person feel good, comforted, relaxed still. Help the person take refuge. If he's familiar with the, uh, the Tisarana, fine. If he's familiar with the Mahayana, Kui Fo, Kui Fa, Kui Sen, fine. If he's familiar with the five precepts, we will help him take the five precepts. But more importantly, our aim is to develop calmness, stillness, and remind him of the Dhamma. If he is familiar with the Pali Suttas, fine. Chant the Ratana, chant the Metta, chant the Sumangala, chant the Sapitiyo. But if he's not, but he is familiar with the Dhamma, then I will say, let us recite it in English to help him remember. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, one more question. Uh, just now you mentioned about the loving kindness and compassion. What if the person, the dying person, um, does not have the metta in nature? How do we nurture it? Well, everybody can feel the metta that we radiate. I mean, of course, the ideal is that everybody is trained in the Buddha Dharma, trained in metta meta meditation but even if the person who is sick or dying is not trained they can sense loving kindness they can sense compassion and this may not be in words of oh may you be well may you be happy or in words like actually chanting the meta bhavana verses it can be simple acts of just holding someone's hand as the person is dying that he is not dying alone that there is someone who is with you who cares for you now, the reality, Sister Eileen, is that if you are a very bad person, which I'm sure you're not, I'm merely using this as an example, but if you are a very bad person, no amount of metta chanting, no amount of sumangala that I do at your bedside is going to make much of a difference because it is the summation of your deeds that is going to make a difference. And similarly, if you are a very good person, whether I chant or I don't chant also will make very little difference. But the point is that at the point in time of transition, where you transit, we want you to have a peaceful mind, a calm mind, a happy mind. A mind that is filled not with anger, unpleasant thoughts, but with Dhamma. And that is what we are trying to do. And even if you cannot do it because you have never heard the Dhamma, I can still hold your heart palm and I say, we are with you, you are not alone, you are loved by all of us. And you can feel it, you can sense it. As I say, even unconscious people, um, you know, people in ICU are usually sedated because of water intubation. But many of them, when they actually are extubated, they recall, they can tell you, I can hear you people talking. I can hear you people, I can sense you people. So that's very important. I'm quite sure the, the elephant didn't feel Oh, sorry, didn't understand whatever words that was being said, but the Buddha's metta could be felt by the elephant. Okay? 
So that's why the elephant stopped charging at the Buddha. He felt the metta. So similarly, human beings can feel the metta. So idea is every one of us, let us be trained, let us be familiar, let us uh, be familiar with chanting of at least a few basic things so that those can be repeated. And um, I think it is very important that all of us, be it in your car or be it in your house, have something playing in the background. In my house, 24 hours is something playing in the background, very soft, um, of either some suttas or whatever, because it trains our mind to be associated that that is wholesome. That is something that ah, I find comfort in. That is the Buddha's words. All right. And I mean, you know, we have so many beautiful metta chanting, ratana and all that, just record it and play it in one of your OCD players, you know, one of your old handphones, you know, just play it and let it run continuously in the background of your house. All right. Thank you, Dr. Puna. Um, in due to time constraint, we'll just take the last question. Yeah. Um, this question is posted by Duka Kors. His question is, shall we accept COVID-19 vaccine when it is available in our country or chanting is better? Well, to the brother who asked the question, the first, of course, that's not a Dhamma question, that's a medical question. So I had to wear another hat, you know, the hat of the doctor. Vaccines are nothing new. Nothing new. We had vaccines for hundreds of years. And even before the proper development of modern vaccines, people were already using very primitive methods of vaccination. Cowpox, for example, is something you will be familiar with. Smallpox used to be a horrible disease and people will inoculate with cowpox to prevent smallpox. So that's first and foremost, nothing new. You're asking me a medical question. You're asking me a medical opinion. And let me put it to you this way. What if you rephrase that question and say, Dr. Wong, will you take the COVID-19 vaccine? And the answer is yes, I will take the COVID-19 vaccine. Then your next question is, which vaccine will you take? Will you take the messenger RNA vaccine that is developed by Pfizer uh, and the Oxford team? Or will you take the Sinovac vaccine, which is an inactivated virus? Well, maybe Sister Liming can tell us more about the technicalities behind. But the, the controversy now is that all the vaccines have been pushed and develop within a very short window. Messenger RNA developing vaccine is new. Messenger RNA developing other things like targeted therapy is not new. It's been around for a few years. But messenger RNA developing vaccine is a relatively new technology. While inactivated vaccines have been around for years. When I was practicing, I inject everybody who is above the age of 60 for flu, with flu vaccine. And that's an inactivated vaccine. That's nothing new. Maybe Sister Eileen from her pharmaceutical industry can also tell us a lot of this. But we've got live vaccines, inactivated vaccines, and of course the modern ones like messenger RNA and DNA vaccines. But inactivated vaccines have been around. They are dead virus. They are literally virus that you powerize until the poor fella is powerless. And then you inject it in to cause your body to stimulate a response. So if you are really worried about the Pfizer messenger RNA vaccine giving you some mutation because it's playing with your DNA, then you go for the inactivated vaccine. Ironically, a fellow colleague texts me in the afternoon. He said, Wong, what, which vaccine will you take? So I said, I'll take the inactivated vaccine. Why? I said, because we've been around for donkey years and I've been injecting people with inactivated vaccines for so long. But that's a medical opinion, all right? Now, chanting. All the chanting will give you a lot of psychological support, a lot of well-being in your mind, but you will need this medicine to cure your body. The Dhamma is to cure your mind. Remember I told you there are two things. The first arrow to be treated with modern medicines, the second arrow to be treated with the Dhamma. Don't confuse the two. Okay, all right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Puna, in answering the question posted by us. Before